presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hande, and I am a doctoral student at Aalto University from in Finland. And this is a joint work with my supervisor, Antti Honkenha, from University of Helsinki. So I would like to start with the definition of alternative supply sink. As most of you might already know, it is a very important mechanism in which the regions of pre-mRNAs are uh, joined uh, dif differentially so that they form... Uh, by the way, can I have a pointer? Yeah, no, this is my this one. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, different parts of pre-mRNAs pre are uh, combined so that they form the alternatively spliced mRNAs. And uh, later they are translated into different proteins. And these different proteins have different functions in the living organisms. Uh, normally, this uh, alternative splicing is a, very, is a normal uh, physiological function, but if some abnormalities occur, then they can also cause diseases such as cancer. So in this study, we are mostly interested in the short-term behaviors of differential splicing in RNA-seq time series. So we are basically modeling the uh, different um, transcripts, isoforms, abundances, during uh, short time series. And during this experiment, we assume that the genetics is kept same because there has been uh, more studies about uh, gen genetics uh, factors affecting the alternative splicing. But here we are not uh, interested in that. We just assume that we are looking at only one cell line. Genetics are same and how are the abundances change of these different transcript isoforms. And this is an uh, outline of my method. So first we start with uh, raw RNA-seq reads, uh, which are obtained at different time points. And then we align these reads by using a reference transcriptome. And here we use bow tie, but of course there are other uh, methods we can also use. Um, and after aligning the reads to the reference transcriptome, by using uh, BitSeq, we estimated the expression level estimates for transcripts. Uh, here, the important part is that uh, we don't have only the ex uh, point estimates for transcript expressions, but we also have a distribution for them. So BitSeq creates MCMC samples, and then from them we can also estimate uh, estimate the uncertainty about this uh, transcript expression levels. Uh, for example, we can also do the same by using Callisto, uh, but in this study we used BitSeq. And after having these transcript expression level estimates, we, uh, we had three settings uh, which we modeled time series. Uh, first for overall gene expression levels, Second, for transcript absolute expression levels, which means that these transcripts are all uh, transcribed from, the, from this gene. And uh, they are, these expression levels are given in RPKA. Uh, the third one is the model for transcript relative expression levels. This is the um, relative abundance of these transcripts which are coming, which are originated from the same gene. So these are basically between zero and one, which gives the ratio of the corresponding uh, transcript among the, uh, all transcripts coming from the same gene. Uh, and how we model the time series? Uh, by using Gaussian process models. Uh, Gaussian process models are a Bayesian non-parametric methods, and they are very useful for uh, short time series and uh, mostly sparse time series, and they perform very well. And uh, the definition is that the Gaussian process is a collection of random variables and a finite subset of which have a joint Gaussian distribution. Um, and it is defined by the mean and covariance function. And the most important thing is here the covariance function because um, it allows us to uh, model the temporal 
change or like we can assume some underlying assumptions like smoothness or the length scale parameter. So yeah, covariance function is very important and these are the most common, uh, commonly used uh, covariance function examples. One is squared exponential. This one assumes that the model has a uh, smooth change and it assumes the, co the covariance between different time points are non-zero and uh, this relationship is modeled by, diff by two parameters, alpha. Alpha uh, determines the uh, amplitude of this function and then uh, length scale L determines like how quickly this uh, changes occur or how slowly they occur. Uh, and white noise covariance matrix is just uh, an identity matrix multiplied by a variance and it is for modeling the noise variance which are applied to the observations. And in this paper, we also introduced a, an additional covariance matrix, which we called fixed variances. So basically here, we don't estimate the hyperparameters. Instead, we uh, fix these variances, and we estimated these variances from the BITSIC uh, samples. So we have variance estimates for each time point. And we set them inside the uh, covariance matrix so that they play a lower bound for the variance. So, and why these uh, fixed variances are important? So I would like to show it with a simple illustration. Here on the left side, I have simulated uh, Gaussian processes uh, from a changing time, changing model and temporally changing model and a uh, constant model. And if we, try to estimate this uh, underlying GP model by after uh, observing this red uh, data points uh, by using only naive GP without using the fixed variances. We might, we see that like uh, the posterior distribution uh, tends to shrink between these observed data points and uh, sometimes we have the overfitting problems as we can see here. And once we introduce the fixed variances inside the covariance functions, then we get a more reasonable fit to the GPs. And this is also important in the case where you have more many uh, time series and you want to rank them according to the uh, level of their temporal activities. And if, in case that we use only named GPs, such cases might occur in the uh, top of the ranked list, and we don't want this to happen. Uh, so that's why uh, this fixed variances really improves the performance. And uh, for ranking these time series, we, for each of the uh, time series, we fit two different GP models with different covariance functions. In the null model, we assume that it comes from a constant function and then the covariance matrices are only the noise uh, covariance matrices, white noise and the fixed one. And in the alternative model, we assume that it changes, it has a changing uh, pattern. And that's why we included the squared exponential covariance matrix as well. And by uh, dividing their uh, marginal likelihoods, we get a bias factor. So high bias factor means that uh, it, it is highly to come from a uh, temporally changing model. Um, and here, like how do we get this mean and variance information from BITSIC AMC AMC samples? So as you can see, we have BITSIC AMC AMC samples for each transcript. And uh, let's say this first gene has only three transcripts and we simply sum up the expression levels of all these transcripts to get the expression levels for the gene. And then the transcript relative uh, is simply the absolute transcript expression level divided by the gene expression level and we have them for each MCMC sample. And by simply we take the mean and variance of these. Of course, this is uh, just the technical variance and uh, as shown in 
this bit sick paper, Glaus et al, bioinformatics. Uh, the biological variance ten is uh, expectedly larger, and then only the bit sick MCMC samples are not enough to is, uh, take into account this uh, biolog biological variance as well. Uh, that's why we introduced an uh, shaped experiment design in our simulation studies and try to see if we can make use of having only replicas at one time point and uh, somehow modeling the variance across the mean by using these replicas from the first time point and then propagate the variances to the rest of the time series depending on the mean expression levels we had. So uh, in the simulation, we simulated 10 time point uh, time series by using on the first chromosome and we generated three replicates at each time point by using a, a negative binomial model with over dispersion parameter uh, set to 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, so these are the precision recall curves for uh, over dispersion parameter 0 0.1. So we uh, obtained a similar results for other over dispersion parameters. So that's why I'm only showing this here. Uh, so for the gene ex overall gene expression level, uh, we see that the worst performance is coming from unreplicated uh, naive GP. So we don't have any replicas and we are not using the fixed variances. It performed, and these uh, numbers in the parentheses are the average precisions. Uh, once we have two replicates, three replicates, then actually we get a very a good performance. However, in the, uh, if we are not able to have replicates, then we can have um, this L-shaped experiment design, which is shown here as unreplicated model, and this uh, pink one also outperforms the unreplicated name, and the uh, uh, blue line shows the unreplicated case, but we, this time we introduced these fixed variances coming from the BitSec, but only the technical variances. Uh, so similar trends also observed in transcript absolute expression levels. Here, I am skipping them quickly because I don't have enough time, I think. And also for the transcript relative expression, uh, we observe the same rank for the different methods for, with different experiment designs. And then we applied this method on a, on a real data and our real data set consists of uh, RNA-seq data obtained from MCF7 breast cancer cell lines. Uh, and the time points were like 0.5, 10 to uh, 1,280 minutes. And uh, since we didn't have any replicates, we assumed that the first three time points are very close to each other and they can be considered as replicates. So we took this tree and we uh, modeled them in dependent variances from these and we propagated that, the variance to the other time points. So. I would like to show you three examples. We have uh, seen different behaviors in absolute or relative expression levels. The first one is here, the overall gene expression. And here, two different transcripts in their abundance uh, expression levels. And in the rightmost figure shows that uh, the relative expression level of the transcripts. We can see that like uh, the absolute expression levels might change, but actually in the relative uh, expression, like relative usage of this iso isoforms remain constant. Another example is that, uh, another example with RHOQ gene. Um, here we can see that, for example, this red one stays constant and then in the relative expression it might change. So they all show different uh, behaviors in different settings. Uh, this is also another example which uh, behave similarly in both. Uh, and then we summed up our uh, findings in this table. So these are the number of non-DE and DE genes which have at least one transcript belonging to uh, these uh, 
differential expressed, differentially expressed for absolute and relative, and this uh, means constant non-differential expressed. So basically, these cells uh, are most interesting. Uh, we have seen that like al almost 11% of the genes had these behaviors like at different uh, temporal activities in different levels. So uh, you can see more examples in an uh, interactive browser and it is uh, possible to rank them by Bayes factors or uh, different fault change values. Uh, so, as conclusions, we have shown that the incorporation of variance information into the GP models increases the performance of our methods. And we also saw that the regulation of the splicing is really complicated. And we should remember to consider both absolute level and relative level changes in the transcript expression analysis. Uh, so, source code is also available on GitHub and we are working on a R package. So uh, it will also include the browser and we are trying to have an easy to use interface. So, and finally, I would like to thank Academy of Finland, Alfred Cordelian Foundation and HITSIC for providing my travel funding. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I will take them.